Africa will always be the Africa of the Victorian Atlas, Graham Greene once wrote. The blank, unexplored continent, the shape of the human heart. Only 150 years ago, Africa south of the Sahara still remained a vast, dark wilderness never reached by white men. For the Victorians, it was a place of myth and danger that shadowed their dreams and fed their passion for exploration. And for millennia, a single mystery had obsessed the world's geographers. No man had yet found the place where the world's longest river, the White Nile, had its source. To the man who could solve this ancient puzzle would fall the greatest geographical prize since the discovery of America. But not until 1856 did two eccentric and mismatched Englishmen set out for the dead center of the continent to claim that dangerous prize. In command of the expedition was a highly celebrated explorer, scholar and linguist, Richard Francis Burton, the man who shocked the Victorian world with his translation of the Kama Sutra. Burton took as his second in command an unknown, though highly ambitious, 33-year-old Indian Army officer, John Hanning Speak, with whom he'd already faced death in Somalia. One of Britain's foremost explorers and writers, Michael Asher, has long been fascinated by Burton and is now researching a new biography. For Michael, at the heart of Burton's life is one central mystery. Why, after his groundbreaking expedition to Africa, which should have guaranteed his place in history, did Burton become an outcast, buried here in an obscure West London tomb? Burton's always been very much my hero, to the extent that I've named my own son Burton after him. And to me, Richard Burton has always been the ideal of the all-round man. He was not only a man of action, he was also a man of intellect, a poet, a man who could speak 30 languages, the author of 43 books, certainly one of the greatest men of his age. It seems almost that Richard Burton has been relegated to a minor place in history. I found it very moving that his tomb should be tucked away here in a small cemetery in Mortlake when his wife Isabel tried to get him buried in Westminster Abbey, a much more worthy place for a man like Sir Richard Burton. At the Royal Geographical Society, which sponsored the expedition, Michael is searching for clues as to what must have happened between the two explorers in Africa. In the space of two years, they turned from close friends into mortal enemies. I've always regarded Speak as a snake in the grass. After all, Richard Burton gave him his big chance to take part in this groundbreaking expedition, the first penetration of the interior of Africa by Westerners. And at the end of the journey, Speak betrayed this man who'd given him his chance. Michael wants to understand why Speak grabbed the limelight and the adoration of the public when he rubbished Burton to their sponsors. Speak claimed it was he, not Burton, who had found the true source of the Nile. But the day before his claims were to be evaluated, he died a violent death in mysterious circumstances. Still brooding on the death of his former friend, Burton was to write, I saw him at 1.30 p.m. and at 4 p.m. He was dead. The charitable say that he shot himself. The uncharitable say that I shot him. <laughs> 
phantom of the future cast a shadow upon our sunny path. As we set out, determined either to do or die, I find my journal brimful of enthusiasm. Of the gladdest moments in human life, methinks, is the departure upon a distant journey into unknown lands. Unlike most biographers, I always enjoy experiencing the same things that my subjects experience. I wanted to make the same journey that they'd made, travelling under similar conditions, hoping that somewhere along the way I would find echoes of their own journey. Truly prepossessing was our first view of the mysterious island of Zanzibar. The sea of purest sapphire lay basking, lazy as the tropical man under a blaze of sunshine. All was voluptuous with gentle swellings, with the rounded contours of the girl negress. As I approached the island following in Burton's wake, I realised that as he got nearer, this exotic image he'd had from far out at sea started to fade, and the darker side of the island started to take its place. He describes how he saw corpses floating in the water. These cadavers were actually the bodies of very sick slaves which had been thrown overboard by the Arab traders to avoid having to pay import duty on them. Just before Christmas, 1856, Burton and Speke arrived in Zanzibar from Bombay, where they'd both been serving as army officers. As the trading center for the whole of East Africa, Zanzibar was the natural place to start. From here, Arab slave traders had cut a path to the center of the continent. This was the route that Burton and Speke were to follow once the Sultan of Zanzibar had given his permission. The explorers spent six months here, helped by British Consul Colonel Hamilton, gathering information and supplies. As I wandered around the streets of Stone Tower, I got an overwhelming sense of a very Arab atmosphere to the place. And I started to understand why Burton had felt so at ease here. Burton loved the Arabs. He spoke fluent Arabic. He'd spent many years amongst the Arabs, just as I myself have done. And I could understand why he fitted into the place so easily. Whereas Speak, who knew no foreign languages and wasn't really interested in understanding the customs of, uh, of the East, should have felt himself very uneasy in a place like this. And I wondered whether perhaps this was the beginning of the differences between them. Burton felt that it was very important to adopt local customs and he felt indeed that it was dangerous not to and he worried about Speak's inability to be anything other than a, an Englishman. Speak felt, I think, that Burton went far too much in the opposite direction and he disapproved of Burton's experimentation with sex, with alcohol and drugs. And Speak was a very prudish man, I think, who felt very uneasy in the presence of women. 
and speaks journals, it seems that he was very embarrassed in the presence of nudity amongst the natives. Whereas Burton, who was, of course, one of the fathers of modern anthropology, uh, was capable of describing these things with clinical detachment. And, indeed, it seems to have gone round in Zanzibar measuring the size of uh, men's penises. Debauched women prefer Negroes on account of the size of their parts. I measured one man who, in quiescence, numbered nearly six inches. This is a characteristic of the Negro race and of African animals like the horse. In my time, no honest Hindi Muslim would take his women folk to Zanzibar on account of the huge attractions and enormous temptations there and thereby offered to them. When he wasn't adding to European stereotypes of the African male, Burton was worrying about the dangers that lay ahead of him in the interior. Let's remember that no other Europeans had been there before them. The only people who had been there were the Arab slave traders, and the only one of these slave traders who was left as a record of what it was actually like inside Africa during that period is a man called Tiputi. And I managed to discover that one of his great-great-grandchildren was still living on the island. Umi Mafud Ali Hamad agreed to help Michael find descendants of people who may have had contact with the Victorian explorers. So I suppose with ancestors like yours, you must be a very good sailor, Umi. <laughs> Talking to Umi, I started to realize how far into the interior her extended family reached. And I tentatively suggested that she might like to accompany me for at least part of the journey perhaps to introduce me to some of her Arabic-speaking relatives. I'm sure you'll be fine. I've got a quizzy tummy already. Yeah. I had this tremendous sense of excitement because we were sailing from Zanzibar towards what used to be called the Dark Continent. And although it's not the same today as it was 150 years ago, it's still a very strange place. What I remember most of all was Hamilton's parting comment to Burton and Speak. I hope you will get on well together. Did Hamilton know something that Burton and Speak themselves didn't know? As Burton and Speak set out on board an 18 gun ship, Neither knew if they would ever return. Burton overheard a servant ask why the white men wanted to carry a small metal boat over land to float on a lake that they would never live to see. Travelling on a dhow without an engine, with the sail cracking, feeling you're being borne along by the Earth's elements. There's something very sort of primitive and very satisfying about that. When the explorers first arrived on this coast, Bagamoyo was a busy depot for Arab ivory and slave caravans from the interior. As the explorers were carried ashore, they knew that the last European to come here before them had only survived a few days. He'd been hog-tied and dismembered to the ritual beat of a drum. Life then was dangerous and short. Only a handful of Christian missionaries had ever set foot on African soil, and very few had survived. At Bagamoyo, we visited the Catholic Mission, which is the oldest church in this part of Africa. Father Henschel, the local priest, showed me around the graveyard, and I was astonished to see how many Catholic fathers had died at the very young age, I mean, younger than 30. Twenty-five 
29, 21, all because of malaria. Really? They came from Europe, those sisters from Reunion. They worked for some few years, got malaria, died. So these are all missionaries, all, every one of them? Yeah, all. Right. It really brought home what Burton and Speak had been facing as they stood in this place, looking towards this, the interior of this unknown continent, because it teemed with diseases that they knew nothing about. And when I thought about it, it's absolutely astonishing that they managed to survive at all. On the 27th of June, 1857, the explorer's caravan of 132 men and 30 asses at last struck out for the interior. Loaded with cloth, wire and beads to bribe hostile tribes, scientific instruments, books, furniture, livestock and a two-year supply of ammunition, each man carried a 70-pound load. I was entering the unknown land at the fatal season when the shrinking of the waters after the wet monsoon would render it a hotbed of malaria. The only map the explorers had was drawn up by missionaries who'd heard reports of a giant slug-shaped lake in the center of the continent. From Bagamoyo they traveled west, redrawing the map as they went. They were heading for what they'd heard was a small Arab trading post called Tabora. But unlike his predecessors, whose journey lasted more than two years, Michael opted to trace their route by railway for the first 600 miles to Tabora. Okay, come on, we better, we better hurry, it's leaving in two minutes. Heading on towards Tabora at a rate his hero might have envied, Michael searched for clues to the relationship between Burton and Speak. He found Burton had confided in his journal that though he found Speak energetic, courageous and persevering, he also began to think him crooked-minded and cantankerous. But when Speak became seriously ill, Burton got the deepest insight into his true nature. By chance, it happened very close to where the train stopped. It was at this point that Speak apparently suffered the most serious attacks of fever he'd had so far. And as Burton wrote, I was compelled to halt. My invalid sub had been seized with a fever fit that induced a dangerous delirium during two successive nights. He became so violent that it was necessary to remove his weapons and, to judge from certain symptoms, the attack had a permanent cerebral effect. My companion let fall certain expressions, which, to my infinite surprise, showed that he'd been nursing great grievances. Unaccustomed to sickness, he could not endure it in himself nor feel for it in others, and he seemed to enjoy pleasure in saying unpleasant things. Burton was shaken to find that Speak's bout of sickness and lunatic behavior had suddenly stripped the mask off a far deeper, darker grudge against himself, of which he'd been unaware. From this uh, bout of fever and delirium, Burton began to make some conclusions about Speak's real character. As he writes here, he would brood perhaps for years over a chance word which a single outspoken sentence of explanation could have satisfactorily settled. The inevitable result was the exaggeration of fact into fiction, the distortion of the true into the false. Despite Burton's insight into Speak's distorted sense of reality, Michael couldn't help sympathizing also with Speak as he faced Burton's intimidating arrogance. I think a lot of people were afraid of Burt. He was called the best mind of his generation. Not one of the best minds, but the best mind of his generation. And I'm sure he was a clever dick. He did put people's backs up by his, his vast knowledge and his, you know, brilliant oratory. And, you know, his ability to, could run rings around people, you know, with his wit and his, you know, could quote poetry in Portuguese and Spanish and Arabic, you know. 
all these things. I mean, it's hit, I mean, no wonder people like Speak, you know, who was mainly interested in you know physical uh, endurance and killing animals, you know, hunting, you know, this is very these very sort of basic things. You know, no wonder people like Speak felt diminished by Burton. After four and a half months and 600 miles, Burton's exhausted caravan reached Tabora on November the 7th, 1857. Receiving a warm welcome from the civilized Arab traders here, the explorers were in for a big surprise. The Arabs now told them that the missionary's map of a slug-shaped lake was wrong. In fact, there were two giant lakes, one to the north, the other to the west. One of them must surely prove to be the source of the Nile. The question was, which one? Before deciding whether to search for the northern or the western lake, Burton had to bargain for safe passage from the all-powerful chief Fundakira of the Wanyamwezi tribe. Umi's uncle Suleiman is a relative of today's chief and agreed to introduce Michael. I was delighted to find that Umi had a relation who was the chief of the Wanyamwezi, named Fundikira, the same name as the chief of the Wanyamwezi in Burton's time and a direct descendant of the same man. But I went to meet him with some trepidation because I'd read the accounts in Burton of how the Wanyamwezi had a reputation for great ferocity and uh, severity. In fact, they were the most important trading tribe in the whole of East Africa and they didn't get that status for nothing. Uh, one way of putting people to death that the Wanyamwezi had, for example, was squeezing their heads in a kind of wooden vice until the brains actually popped out. Chief, very nice to meet you. My pleasure. Chief So this is all your family, uh, Chief? Yes. Um, this is what remains of my family. Really? Uh, my father had uh, 55 sons and daughters. That's amazing. Uh, and how many wives did he have? Well, of course, the number fluctuated sometimes, but the maximum number that he had was around 30. Really? Or at the same oh. time? Yeah, at the same time. Yeah. But um, your, your great-great-grandfather was the first Fundikira. Yes. Who was here at the time that, that Burton and Speak came. Yes. And he had tremendous power, uh -huh. had the power of absolute life and death over his subjects. Certainly he did. He would uh, uh, give judgment himself. Really? And uh, if it was uh, proved that uh, the person was guilty of that offence, then the chief would pronounce uh, the sentence of death in serious cases. Yes. And the sentence would be carried out there and there, immediately. And how would the sentence be carried out? By spearing. By spearing. Uh, so he would be speared to death in front of the whole community? In front community. of the whole community. The chief's support proved vital to the explorers when later they met some of the more aggressive tribes who adorned their villages with human skulls. Umi wanted to spend some time with her uncle and family before returning to Zanzibar. But for Michael it was time to set out on the last and most difficult leg of his journey. It's great to see you. I thought you would never get here. You've been so long. Hello, Mike. Uh, How are you? Joined by his son, Burton, and wife, Marie Antonietta, Michael now hoped to complete the journey to Lake Tanganyika, 
under the same conditions as his predecessors. Mountainetta is a very seasoned explorer herself. She and I made the first ever crossing of the Sahara Desert from west to east, so I knew that if there was one person who wouldn't object to those conditions, it would be her. Really? He'll be all right. He'll be all right. This is, I mean, this the only donkeys they have in this village. But, yeah. So, you know, we have to make do with what they've got. I myself traveled thousands of miles by camel, but I didn't really have much experience of traveling by donkeys. So, you know, I had no idea how it would work out. Yeah, this is the youngest. Simply trying to load these donkeys for the first time in, in the local village proved a nightmare. This is the best they can do in this place. You know, they haven't got a proper saddle, nothing. Pull him, pull him. Come on. Pull. Come and help me. The animals had been laden with difficulty. Their kicking and plunging, rearing and pawing had prevented the nice adjustments of their packs. On the road, they rushed against one another. They bolted, they shied, and they threw their impediments with such persistence that my servant could not help exclaiming, their name is Jackass. Come here, please. We need you. There's another <laughs> We've been told by the local people that donkeys hate water, and I was slightly skeptical about this, but I discovered very quickly that it was the absolute truth. The donkeys had been going fine until we came to the banks of the Malagarasi, and then they simply stopped and they were obviously weren't prepared to go any further. I'd laughed at all these stories that, oh no, the donkeys will never cross the river, they hate water. And then when I found it was true, it was rather an embarrassing moment. That's why I decided to, the only way we could do it was by actually dragging them across one by one and the local people stood on the banks on both sides and watched us with great hilarity. Everything is going to get wet, Mike. Well, it's a bit late now. <laughs> Crossing the river, I was constantly worried about the, the possibility of being attacked by crocodiles. Burton himself had written that the Malagarasi was absolutely infested with crocodiles, and particularly voracious ones, apparently. And we'd learned from the local villagers that crocodiles still lived in the Malagarasi and, in fact, had killed a number of adults and children in recent years. I'm coming with my stick! By the time he reached the Malagarasi River himself, Burton's expedition had taken seven months to walk nearly a thousand miles, at a rate he calculated at just over two miles an hour. we were saddened by the sight of the clean-picked skeletons and here and there swollen corpses of porters who had perished in this place of starvation. Under these circumstances, as might be expected, several of our party caught the infection. They lagged behind, 
and probably threw themselves into some jungle, for the path, when revisited, showed no signs of them. The sight of dead and dying porters preyed heavily on Burton, as he was himself so sick by now that he was semi-paralyzed and suffering from depression. As we got the donkey caravan moving, we started to feel absolutely euphoric. Of course, it was much harder travelling by foot than it is sitting in a motor car. But this is what we had wanted from the beginning, to travel exactly as Burton and Speak had done in the same environment, to feel what they had felt as they had walked across Africa. Our euphoria didn't last for very long, unfortunately, because very soon the guide had led us into a huge patch of thorn. No, I'm sorry, we take the donkeys, come on. <clears throat> there was no way round the thorn scrub, we had to go right through the middle of it, and the earth from which the thorns grew was cracked into great crevices and the donkeys refused to go forward and we had to Come. drag them by the ropes which was excruciatingly hard work especially as our legs were being cut to pieces by the thorns. By now the Victorian explorers increasingly resented each other. Speak seemed discontented with Burton's decisions and complained of not being consulted. He confessed to Burton that he found it unbearable to be part of an expedition of which he was not himself the leader. And as the going got tougher for Michael, both his own authority and the guide's competence came under fire. We can't. <clears throat> we can't come here. There's not room. Keep going, Burton. Don't stop. Ow, shit. Surely there must be a better track than this. That's what I said. I can't believe it's all thorns like this. Just keep going, keep going. <laughs> oh, Chuma, the donkey's butting my bottom. Lieutenant Speak was uncommonly hard to manage. And having been for years his own master, he had a way as well as a will of his own. To a peculiarly quiet and modest aspect, aided by blue eyes and blonde hair, he united an immense and abnormal fund of self-esteem. He ever held not only that he had done his best on all occasions, but that no man living could have done better. Ah, oh, Christ! Just keep going, keep going. The rigours of their own journey caused the Ashes to re-evaluate the characters of both Speak and Burton. To Michael's surprise, he found himself starting to sympathise far more with Speak. I must admit I started off with that view, you know, that Burton was the goody and Speak was the baddie. But I've changed that considerably on this journey because, you know, I felt, you know, travelling with a large group of people, the camera crew and the rest of it, you know, I felt you know, that I was no longer the leader of the expedition, you know? And I felt, you know, sidelined, and I think that's what Speak must have yes, felt, you know? Yes, of course. That he'd been sidelined. He had these abilities. He had led expeditions, very small ones before, mm. and lived very rough. And here he was. The only way he could do this journey was by being subordinate to Burton, who was this sort of overwhelming figure. Yeah, and he couldn't compete with Burton. Well, I don't know what you mean. He couldn't com compete with Burton in certain spheres. Yeah, like... Uh, but I, you know, I think he was every like bit as tough physically oh, yes, as definitely. Burton. Perhaps yeah. more. He had great determination and great courage and endurance, you know? Well, those are qualities to be admired. Yeah. 
It was endurance that Burton most needed as his illness reached a crisis, unbalancing his mind and preventing him from walking for a total of 11 months. The useless fatigue of walking and the sorry labor of waiting and reloading the asses, the wear and tear of mind, the prospect of imminent failure were all beginning to tell heavily upon me. I developed a queer conviction of divided identity, never ceasing to be two persons that generally thwarted and opposed each other. The sleepless nights brought with them horrid visions, animals of grisliest form, hag-like women, men with two heads protruding from their breasts. I imagine these two explorers traveling along under these terribly harsh conditions. And the only thing that kept them going was the knowledge that somewhere in front of them lay this vast lake. And they were going to be the first people from their own culture ever to see it. When the explorers at last glimpsed Lake Tanganyika in the distance, they couldn't at first tell if it really was a lake or how big it was. But when Burton did finally manage to catch its full glory, at least it was in the daylight. By the time we got there, it was completely dark, and I found that very, very disappointing, that we hadn't finally, after all our travels, been able to see the lake as he saw it. Speak too missed the experience due to a severe eye disease which only gave him a vague impression of mist and glare. Wow, wow. fantastic. He's brilliant. I felt willing to endure double what I had endured, said Burton as he gazed at the longest lake in the world. If a river flowed out of this lake, Burton believed it could be the Nile. If so, he was now within reach of the greatest discovery since America, but fate was about to deal him a terrible blow. Tantalized at last to be within reach of his goal and delighted to find plentiful food here, Burton's sickness was about to put his life in jeopardy. At sunset, the attack had reached its height. I saw yawning way to receive me, those dark gates across the wild that no man knows. If one of us was lost, the other might survive to carry home the results of the exploration. I had undertaken the journey with the resolve either to do or die. I had done my best, and now nothing appeared to remain for me but to die as well. Burton's illness left him dependent on Speak, whose eyesight had now improved. Burton sent Speak to hire the only sailing boat on the lake from an Arab trader. Almost out of time and money, this was the only way they could hope to reach the source of the Nile quickly. This is a picture of the, the very men we're talking about, the men who probably planted these mango trees. Yeah. That's the boat that they, one of the boats they used for uh, traveling in Lake Tanganyika 150 years ago. Okay. And what we'd like to get is a boat that looks something like that. But without Burton's language skills and tact, 
Speke antagonized the Arab boat owner and four weeks later came back empty-handed. He brought some good news, however. He'd heard that a river did flow out of the lake to the north. Electrified by this rumor, Burton got off his sickbed and arranged to hire two giant canoes. Yeah, it is possible to rent. Yeah. How much would he ask? Burton was still near death. Anybody seeing him go, wrote Speak, would have despaired of his ever returning. But he could not endure being left behind. Eight men carried Burton to the lake in his hammock and put him in the front of the biggest canoe, where he sat under the fluttering Union Jack as they set off once more into the unknown. They traveled northwards, hugging the coast, towards the lands of the fearful cannibals, the Webembe and the Wado. Burton was frustrated at their slow progress. As time ran out, he knew that the odds of finding the source of the Nile and of surviving grew worse every day. The conditions they traveled under were horrific. I mean, it was the rainy season. It rained almost all day, every day. The boats were overcrowded. Human excrement began to pile up in the boats. I mean, the, the conditions were just horrific. And yet, Burton never lost this desire to go onwards. After paddling north for several weeks, Burton's canoes were only a day away from the place where Speke had been told the Ruzizi River flowed out of the lake, near the village of Uvira. But here, Burton met some Arabs who insisted the river flowed into the lake and not out of it, as Speak had understood. Burton never accepted this story. He was determined as a true explorer to see the Ruzizi for himself to discover whether it actually flowed into or out of the lake. The explorers were only a day from their goal when the boatmen refused to go on for fear of the Wivira cannibals. Now low on food and unable to persuade the men, the expedition returned to Tabora, defeated. Once safely back in Tabora, Speak now decided to travel north with only a few men to verify reports of an even larger lake. But to ensure their survival, Burton had to stay in Tabora to beg supplies and porters from the Arabs to get them home. As a result, Burton never shared the extraordinary sight that awaited Speak at Mwanza. When Speak gazed out over this great expanse of water, a local told him it stretched to the end of the earth. Inspired by this hearsay and a faulty altitude calculation, Speak decided he must at last be looking at the source of the Nile. Renaming the lake Victoria after his queen, Speak shot several birds to celebrate and headed back to tell Burton he'd solved the great Nile mystery. But his evidence failed to convince the more careful and scientific Burton. Heading home over Lake Victoria, Michael tried to understand why Speak had taken such a risk to claim this lake was the source of the Nile on the basis of so little evidence. Had he really believed it himself? I felt that my journey had revealed to me something important about Speak, because I think, realizing what kind of man Burton was, Speak knew that if he didn't get his oar in now, that he would never have the chance again. And Speak must have said to himself at some point, if I don't get it in now, then Burton will be appointed as leader of the next expedition, 
Perhaps I will be dropped altogether. It suddenly occurred to me that perhaps Speak hadn't been convinced at all, that he'd merely saw that he had an opportunity here. I mean, if he was right, then so much the better. If he was wrong, then it would take several years to prove it. And in the meantime, he would have been acclaimed as the greatest explorer of his time. As Speke sailed for England ahead of Burton, he promised not to tell anyone about the two Great Lakes until Burton himself got back. But when Burton arrived at the Royal Geographical Society two weeks later, he found Speke had double-crossed him and addressed their sponsors in his absence. Speke told them that he, not Burton, had found the source of the Nile. His reward was the command and the money for a second expedition, this time without Burton. I reached London on May the 21st and found that everything had been done for, or rather against me. My companion now stood forth in his true colours, an angry rival. A college friend thus correctly defined my position. Burton, shaken to the backbone by fever, disgusted, desponding and left behind both in the spirit and in the flesh, was in racing parlance, nowhere. Never again able to raise funds for another expedition, Burton began drinking heavily, while Speke went back on a second expedition to Lake Victoria. After two years, Speke discovered a river and waterfalls flowing out of what he assumed was the northern end of the same lake, but he failed to prove beyond a doubt that this was the Nile. Far from having settled the controversy, Speke's expedition had further muddied the waters and created even more confusion. It failed to squash Burton's idea that Lake Tanganyika might still be a source of the Nile. So to evaluate Speke's claims, a public debate was arranged at which Burton, Livingston and others would have a chance to test Speke's theory against their own rival claims. The day before the debate, Speke faced Burton for the first time since their expedition together. Realising the debate would probably be won by the brilliant Burton, Speke left the meeting early to go shooting on a relative's estate. As he clambered over a wall, carelessly carrying a loaded and cocked shotgun, it went off. A few minutes later, Speke was dead. <laughs> I wanted to see the place where Speke had met his death, to see if I could find any sort of inkling as to what had really happened there. The real question is, did he actually shoot himself? And obviously, many people at the time believed that he'd shot himself. What I think happened was that Speak was convinced that the next day at the meeting, Burton was going to expose him as a charlatan. And if my intuition at Lake Victoria was correct, that Speak had actually said to himself, look, I'm gonna say this is the source of the Nile, even though I can't prove it. And then suddenly it seemed to him perhaps that tomorrow this whole thing was going to be exposed. I don't think he consciously said to himself, right, I'm going out to put a bullet in my head. But what I do think is that somewhere in his unconscious mind, you know, he might have had a desire to save himself from the incredible humiliation that he felt he was going to receive the next day. Burton admitted 20 years later that he had been wrong and speak right about the source of the Nile. He wrote, there is a time to leave the dark continent. Madness comes from Africa. Yeah, 